retired by the fourth, fifth day, and he said to me something that changed me forever after I didn't speak to him for about three days. He said, do you understand the math you're teaching? I said, I have a degree in mathematics. He said, that's not what I asked you, Mama. I asked, do you understand the math you're teaching? And I said, absolutely. <coughs> About three or four days, I was so upset with him, but I realized I did not understand the math. I had a good knowledge of math, but I did not have the understanding that would help me to diagnose when they made mistakes. I didn't know what to tell them if they made a mistake. I could show them what to do, and if they could not give it back to me, there was no way I could help them. So, about my third week of school, I'll never forget it. These young men, by the way, I live in a very small community. One of them is my lawyer, one of them is my dentist. <laughs> I said to them, the third week of school, you know guys, I don't understand this man that I've been asked to teach. And I wish you could have seen the look on their face. It was like, the parent is stupid woman. <laughs> my best year of teaching ever. I learned to understand the mathematics. I understood the mathematics. And it changed my whole career of how I was going to teach math and also in physics. I learned it by having those conversations with the students. I knew the rules, but I didn't know why the rules worked. So therefore, I wasn't good at helping anyone who was having difficulty. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? So it was important that I did that. So if I look at this, here are some books real quickly, and they're going to have these up for you. How People Learn talks about how we as adults learn. Learning progressions talks about how children learn math. There is a way that children develop their understanding of math. In the last four years, that's what we've been working with school on. What's the progression by which children develop their understanding of math? It's very critical because when children have gaps, it's like climbing a ladder and you miss a couple of rungs on the ladder. You're not going to go too far. You're going to slip and fly, slide back down. So, How Students Learn is a great book. And then another one is How Children Learn Mathematics. And by the way, if you go to the Australian Council of Educational Research, there's lots of good books on there that talks about how children develop their understanding of mathematics. Now, all of this, all of this has been since the year 2000. We have tons of research. 1989, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics published Principles and Standards for Mathematics, which is basically used in most countries for looking at what will be the mathematics that is taught. They did the original research in 1989. What happened was that everybody said, oh, this is great, this is what we're going to do, but we really didn't look at how children learn mathematics, the progressions. Australia did the original work along with New Zealand. That's been followed up by many, many other countries who have done tons of research on how children learn mathematics. <coughs> That's what the new Common Core in the U.S. is about. Why is this critical? Because from the 21st century skills, it says the, four, the old skills were reading the three R's. You remember that? They're reading, they're writing, and arithmetic, all right? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. The four C's are critical thinking and problem solving, communication, collaboration, creativity, and innovation. That's what's needed for the 21st century. Those are the skills. We do that in the context of those three R's. So we're not going to wear the three R's. It's just that it's a whole new ballgame. This is a ladder by how children develop that understanding up through, up to middle school. When you get to middle school, I want you to look up there, the fact is we get into fractions, ratios, and proportions are huge in the middle school to get them ready for the pathways at the high school level. So all of that is developed at that level. So when we get here, the bridge to understanding is this. Every bit of research says, when children are having difficulty with mathematics, pull out the manipulatives to help them understand, because that gives them a visual. 
1989, when NCTM published it, they said every concept you teach, you must represent it in at least five ways. Words, pictures, numbers, symbols, graphs, charts, and tables. Those are the five ways. Why? Because that gives me the visual of what it is. Remember, good number sense comes from visualizing. What do you see? If I say <coughs> the difference between teaching conceptually and procedurally, I give you the number eight. What do you see? Do you just see a number? Or do you see it as representing eight objects? Do you see it as a point of the number line? Do you see it as measurement? That's what we're getting at, understanding what it is. So, mathematical thinking, it can be a gateway or it can be a block. Too often, it's a block because we have not taught, taught our children to think. So how has mathematics changed? Every bit of literature says we must teach math with a balance between conceptual and procedural. And we must do it in the context of problem solving. How many of you have heard of the Common Core in the U.S.? Okay, some of you. Okay. The Common Core in the U.S., or the core curriculum in Australia, is based upon, is based upon the international benchmarking. And so it gives our schools a priority of here is the floor for every child. If you look at those standards, which you will see here on your, uh, are the standards that are used by this school, it talks about having that good balance between <coughs> understanding and procedure. Okay? If I go too much arithmetic, all I teach you is a procedure, and I never ask you to explain your thinking, and by the way, a lot of our new international assessments say this, uh, in, uh, up through 8th grade, it says, explain your thinking using words, pictures, and or numbers. How do you explain your thinking? If I, give, I go to the middle school and I have a ratio proportion problem to solve, how do you explain? It's not, don't tell me what you did, why did you do it? That's the difference. So what you want to do is ask your children to explain why they did something instead of, tell me what did you do? Okay? You're all looking at me, it's getting nervous here. Watch your block. Okay. So we don't want mathematics to be a block. All children deserve the opportunity to pursue their dream. <coughs> and the 21st century says, our children need a lot more mathematics understanding beyond High school. Are we getting them ready for that? That's the question we have to answer. So, if I go here, knowing something doesn't mean I understand it. Knowing it does not mean I understand it. So, knowing how to ride a bicycle doesn't mean I can ride a bicycle. Knowing all the notes in music, being able to read the scale doesn't mean that I can play an instrument or have a performance. So knowing does not mean I understand it. That's the key to what we're trying to do. So if we look at this, I like this peppermint padding. It's kind of old. She says nothing spoils numbers faster than a lot of arithmetic. What are we asking our children to do? Are we asking them to think? Or are we asking them to solve? So here is what a balanced math program looks like. When we move into the high school, we would expect to see children have, they must have good procedural fluency with their fact families. They must have fluency with computation. By the way, John Hopkins did a really interesting study, I think it was last year, and they sent to the universities <coughs> this question. What is it that you want the students from our schools to uh, have when they get to your university? And they were really anticipating they were going to get things like, oh, they need three levels, three years of math, four years of math. You know what the number one thing was? That you will send.
enough students who can do simple computation without picking up a calculator. Because picking up a calculator to do simple computation slows them down and takes them away from the whole idea of problem solving. Understanding the math that we're supposed to be doing. Conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, and this. This, okay. Very interesting because in the National Assessment of Educational Progress in the U.S., you know, I want you to talk to things. Our students do very well in the basics. The majority of students can do this, but they cannot solve problems. They are not good problem solvers. As a matter of fact, here's what it shows. 90% of our students on the grade four NAEP could do that question. 73 could do the subtraction. Now, the horrible part, only 33% could answer that question. That is unforgivable. That we have children who have gone through our system. And by the way, this is U.S., but it's true in many, many other countries. I just read something from the European Union uh, talking about the math in European countries. And really focusing in on how horrific the programs are preparing <coughs> students for the jobs that are out there. So when we look at this, we look at this, we know that, that here's a little test. No paper, no pencil, how quickly can you solve that? Again, no pressure, grade four. See, I was really nice to you because I gave you the same kind of problem. The same kind of problem. You see? Because one of the mathematical practices we expect children to do is to see the structure of mathematics. Because the beauty of mathematics that we do is we do the same thing over and over again with bigger numbers. But if I look at this, how does a fourth grader solve this? A fourth grader who has been taught to think I want you to think about the beauty if you have fourth graders <coughs> in middle school who have know how to solve these kind of problems. But let me let me just share a study that was done in Australia. I hope I can remember this question. I'm gonna do that. For you all, this looks pretty straightforward, doesn't it? What do you think the majority of students put in that box? Wait, what's to talk Better than 50% of the students wrote this. And then the researchers went back and they asked them, what does that mean? Here are some of the answers. The pause before the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is coming, the second one. <laughs> Isn't that horrible? Because this is because they have been taught to think procedurally <coughs> and not to think relationships, which is what mathematics is about. They do this kind of thing even in kindergarten where they say this is a balance. This is, means the same as. It's a balance. This side has to balance by this side. So 3 plus 8 is something plus 4. Well, I know that 8 is 4 plus 4 and 3 plus 4. I mean, I've seen it done, and this is 4. So what do I have here? I know that that's 7. That relationship. But rather, they've been taught a procedure, so they get really confused. Now, middle school teachers, some of you are here right now, they do this in first grade. Some number plus four is the same as eight. Get them in middle school. And good grief. It's, how do you do that? But don't ever do this. You follow what I'm saying? When we teach them rules, they forget them. But if we teach them to think mathematically, it's very easy to answer. And good grief. Oh, by the way, this was repeated in the U.S. and we didn't do any better. Crest did the same study. And that was with 
Fifth grade students, by the way. Fifth grade students. Why? We've got to teach our children to think what mathematics is about. It's a way of thinking. It's about relationships. It's not about a set of rules. If I can't think mathematically, then it doesn't do any good to teach me all the rules. But if I go back up to this one, the furniture meant was three stools and chairs together. Three-legged and four-legged. He sees that he has 21 seats and 72 legs. How many chairs can he make? How many stools? 21 seats. He lines them up. I saw a boy, young man, fourth grade, just beginning fourth grade, he drew 21 circles. Underneath it, he put three, three little dashes. What is that for? He said, that's the legs. Everything's going to have three legs. Count it. Three, six, nine. Actually counted by threes. He got to, he had 63 legs. That means he said, I have to put a leg here, a leg here, a leg here. I have nine more legs, so I could make nine chairs, and so the rest are stools. We get him in middle school, sorry, middle school teachers. Write the equation, chairs plus stools is 21. So for about four legs on a chair, two legs on a stool is 72. Solve those two simultaneous equations. Think about it. How are our children thinking? Are they thinking mathematically? Does it make sense? How do you think? What did you see? What image did you get when you saw that problem? Don't be like some of the parents of Vanilla said, anxiety, scared. <laughs>
is good if it's about explaining the why. We want our children to be literate. We want our children to be fluent. And we want our children to be successful. The new way, what's happening in mathematics education worldwide, worldwide in every progressive country is we are rethinking the way that we teach mathematics. Are we asking children to think about what they have done, why they have done it? I think one of the saddest things was here last year we were looking at international assessments, which we do in the summertime. And um, the saddest thing for me was there was a space for children to do their work. These were middle school students, by the way. And then there was a space for the answer. These children did the work, and then they erased it and crossed it out. And somebody said, why do you think they do that? And here's what the, the person who was doing the research said. He said, why? Because those are the children, we can put them in the piles. The children where the right answer was valued, and the children <coughs> where the thinking was valued. Where only the answer was valued, my work is top secret, cross it out. Where thinking was valued, I'm going to let it there for the teacher scoring to see what I was doing. So do we value, and the message that I've been giving to, and I work with the middle school this week, is value the thinking of your students. It's critical. It prepares them for the future. So math, math education is undergoing reform. Teachers are working hard because remember, many of our teachers were not trained to teach math conception. They were trained like I was taught. And this is why they spent hours and hours in PD trying to understand the math. Support your teachers, ask questions, but support what's happening. We want your child to be successful. I will take questions. I'm not sure I can answer them, but I'll take them. Go back to the example. Put it in two. It's half. 
divide it again as force, divide it again and say, I can look at that and I get a mental image. Remember, all this visible learning we're hearing about is, what do you see? I cannot do, I don't know how to do 12, not 13s. I can, I can get an idea, but I really don't know. <coughs> so when we get into fifth grade, we move to algorithms, that's different. But I have a good understanding of what the fractions are. I hope I answered your question. Uh, can I just say something else? We've been emphasizing quality over quantity, and I can tell you I've seen that uh, in talking with the teachers. Your child may not come home with tons and tons, I don't know, of, of work, because the literature says it's better to give them fewer problems and have them explain their thinking than to give them 25 or 30 problems of doing the same thing over and over again. Practice is important, I'm not saying that, but practice must be meaningful. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but I, I could understand if he was below that grade and why I, would, I could not. You've got to be able to conceptualize it. Oh, okay, it's very, very specific. It says after they have done the models, you're ready to move to the algorithm. It doesn't mean that we're not teaching the algorithm. But it means that I have to be fluent with it. I think it's fifth grade. Now you're testing. I think it's fifth grade. Okay. The algorithms, okay. It's very specific of when we, my children must be fluent with it. But we move to that gradually. Where we run into trouble is when we teach the algorithm before the understanding, because then it's very difficult to undo. But it's much easier to build that. You need your people. Sort of related to that question, it's a little bit sloppy, so okay. bear with it. In Australia, I think in the US as well, every year we see that our comments in terms of potential practically being historically is getting weaker and weaker. And so the question is in, in terms of what you just explained, the curriculum is what the curriculum is that teaching. Where does that lead us in the Okay, yeah. Okay, that's a very good question. Australia has a brand new curriculum as of last year. It used to be, Australia was like the U.S. Every state had their curriculum. So how many states? There's five or six, I forget. But they each had their own curriculum. That was one of our countries we work with, the student work, so I know a little bit about it. And the weakness was that there was no effort, no concerted national effort to change the teaching of mathematics. Last year, they adopted the international benchmark. As a matter of fact, they've kind of led the way ACER, the Australian Council of Educational Research, and we see major changes in the way math is being taught. Now, I can answer back to the U.S. If in the U.S., how many people are from the U.S.? We hear about all of our weaknesses, but do you know that the National Research Council did a study, and if we pull out our large urban areas, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Los Angeles, we do very, very well. But because those are large populations, it looks like we're at the bottom of the heap. But pull those out, we're right up there on top. Now, in New York City, if anybody's from New York City, major changes. Major changes. I was sharing with this group. Anybody here from the state of Georgia? Okay, Georgia. Six years ago, Georgia was like number 46 or 47 in terms of test scores. They got a governor. I don't know what his politics were, but he came in and he said, if we're going to be competitive economically, we've got to change our education system. They spent tons of money on redoing a statewide curriculum that was not required, but schools could adopt it. Some did, some didn't. And then he did professional development on teaching of math, numeracy, and literacy with the two focuses. They went in four years from being like 46 to last year, I think they were number three.